but please do ask questions. The whole purpose of this is to get both our mentor advisory group and our awardees um, involved in a give and take uh, around the great science that we're going to hear in the course of this series. So with no further ado, uh, let me um, uh, introduce uh, Jonathan Swedler, University of Illinois. He comes from the visionary uh, category of awards. Uh, and his presentation title, uh, as you see, is Creating New Measurement Tools and Using Them to Understand the Chemistry of the Islet. Uh, Jonathan, take it away, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be here. Uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in. Um, I have an acknowledgement slide at the end, but I do want to uh, take this opportunity to really thank um, uh, ADA and the Visionary Award. Uh, it's really uh, changed my research group in some of the directions, and I think this will uh, uh, last for a, uh, a long time uh, into the future. So I thought I would start with one introductory slide and then move into science. And so uh, Visionary Award means um, established. Um, I've been at the University of Illinois for 29 years. Um, I guess you can say uh, uh, that's uh, senior. Um, and so um, my primary appointment is in chemistry, but I'm also in neuroscience, physiology, and a couple other uh, programs uh, on campus. Um, my research group really does two things. One is develops new measurement tools to understand cell to cell signaling. And for most of my research life, I've been using that in the brain. Uh, and um, to be a little bit different, we've been doing that from brains all the way from corals with simple nervous systems to humans. Uh, and so this represents a, a change uh, looking at uh, islet, uh, cell to cell signaling and diabetes, but using many of the same tools. Um, and I like that quote basically, uh, and it's something that's certainly been true in brain science and in um, diabetes research. Uh, sometimes new tools, whether it's transcriptomics, new microscopy approaches or others, really allow us uh, a new vision into um, what's happening in complex uh, systems. And that's certainly true of the island. Um, I also, when I look at the slide of my group, and it now takes me aback, that was taken last January uh, when we were allowed to do that. So this is, you know, the, one of the last times a group got together to take a picture. Uh, my group um, does a lot of mass spectrometry and I think I have one picture of that. Uh, but one of our hypotheses was, um, and, and we had some evidence of this, is that there are, uh, even though everybody is obviously aware of glucagon and insulin and some of the well-characterized hormones, is that there's uh, a lot of other cell-to-cell -cell signaling molecules that exist within an islet. Uh, and uh, these would change and have an impact on uh, disease progression for type one and type two diabetes. And so, uh, my approaches uh, many times run targeted. Sometimes they have a slight target and can include uh, hormones as well as neurotransmitters, islet transmitters, I guess, lipids, amino acids, and others. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about how the approaches work. I'll be happy to talk about those in other ways, uh, other times. Um, and so um, just wanted to, to briefly sort of illustrate, I, just, I guess I could see a, a pointer, maybe it's easier if I um, there, now we have a fake laser pointer. Um, uh, you know, and so we're working with transplant quality uh, islets uh, from various sources, and I'll talk about that to individual cells. We can take a single islet apart and scatter the cells, for example, on a microscope slide and visualize them. And then basically, as I'll show later, shine a laser on them, blow them up, and see what compounds were present. And so this is a destructive technique. Uh, and it in some ways uh, gives you, you know, it's omic scale in the sense that you see a lot of the compounds. It's not complete, but it's more complete. And then you can link this uh, as um, uh, to the chemistry that's occurring in individual islets. So look at islet to islet heterogeneity, uh, basic things such as the uh, loss of beta cells to unusual process forms of hormones. Um, just as a reminder, we're using mass spectrometry. So rather than transcriptomics or microscopes, uh, some of these uh, uh, are shown here. My group has uh, eight mass spectrometers. We use a few others on campus. One of the reasons I will say that you, you have to know something about uh, the different mass spectrometers is that none of these work as well as transcriptomics. And what I mean by that uh, is that uh, if an islet has you know, 10,000 different chemical entities, or if a cell has 10,000 different proteins, 10,000 different metabolites, an equivalent number of lipids. And um, each mass spectrometer maybe can measure a thousand or so, so it's not complete. And so depending on what type of molecules you're looking at, or you have to ionize or treat the samples differently. And so that's this alphabet soup of instruments. 
And I'll leave it at that. I'd be happy to, you know, as part of my group, I'd be happy to talk more about that um, later. So this is a complex slide, and then all the other slides I think are a little bit simpler, but it sort of illustrates uh, another aspect of this is we get samples, uh, the, you know, the best biobank samples are uh, either frozen or they're fixed with, for example, uh, paraformaldehyde. Uh, and I wanted to mention first that paraformaldehyde is a way of basically cross-linking all the molecules and making them into plastic. So if you think of a bowling ball, it, you know, presumably is a single molecule. So you can't, once you've done that, you can visualize cells, but you really can't say, well, that was insulin or glucagon or uh, things like the amino acids. Most of the molecules have been cross-linked. And so the first thing that we did, and we published it this year, and I'll show you an example, is we figured out how to remove that chemical cross-linking simply because uh, this biobank samples are really the, the most rich supply of samples we have. And that's taken us a while to figure out how to deal with that. It's not something we've done before. Um, but you can take this now and you can look at these are individual uh, slices from an islet and these little dots on there are the individual, I'm sorry, that's the pancreas, individual islets. And we can detect then uh, differences in, for example, um, the peptide profiles in each one of those spots. The other thing, which I mostly will be showing you today, are these fresh islets from uh, the Alberta Diabetes uh, Islet Core or the HPAP from UPAN and other sources. I will say, and I'm not going to go into this too much, is that the last six months has been a little bit, actually most of uh, last year has been a little bit hard because some of our supply of, of, of islets from these sources has been uh, curtailed because of uh, COVID. And so that slowed down a little bit of the research. But from these fresh islets, we can actually, uh, and living when we are, uh, they arrive, we're actually able to look at uh, pro-hormone processing. We're able to look at islet heterogeneity uh, and um, other aspects. And then lastly, uh, we just had a, uh, a proposal uh, funded from JDRF where we're getting type one diabetes samples, uh, both islets and uh, plasma and a few other samples. And we're actually looking at some of the molecules. Each one of these has different uh, strengths and weaknesses. For example, some of the molecules are not stable. Uh, and others can be measured. Uh, so that's why we use a large number of sample types. This is um, you know, uh, a more technical slide and then I'm gonna show you some of the results, but this is what I was telling you about. And this is um, these cross-link samples. Uh, we have to remove the cross-links. Uh, you would think this is a solved problem, but most people that are actually cross-linking uh, samples to preserve don't, you know, they like the fact that you have um, well-preserved morphology and don't worry about the chemistry. Uh, and so it took us a while, uh, and we now have the ability to remove the cross-linking and see the peptide hormones. Uh, this is just showing you a picture of a, uh, an islet after it's fixed. This is after we've removed the cross-linking, and this is just showing you a mass spectrum with some of the hormones. Uh, we can see others uh, measured, and this is now uh, showing you our imaging of this, where you can actually see individual dots, which are islets, and you can see colors related to the masses of glucagon or amylin or insulin or others, and they do overlap. Uh, and you actually can see different intensities and different islets representing different amounts of peptides. Uh, this is for a sample that was stored for five years. And so um, this is uh, really um, uh, going to enable a lot of uh, research with these biobank samples. Uh, this was just published, but it's been online for a few months. We've already got a lot of interest uh, for people outside of the field of uh, diabetes research, just trying to replicate this for their samples. And so again, I would have thought this was a solved problem, but. Now we have the ability to remove the cross-linking and do mass spectrometry on these, uh, I'd say long-term stored samples, but at least you know, five or six years, uh, probably a lot longer. But this is uh, the approach we use for single cells. It's something we developed in our lab. It's a very simple approach. I showed this a couple of years ago, but it's worth uh, reminding uh, people you can take, this is showing you a, a different sample, but you can take a cell out from an islet or others uh, and put it on a microscope slide, for example, and then when you shine a, uh, you, you put a matrix around it and you shine a laser, you blow up the cell. Some of the molecules, the hormones, the lipids come out and you get a mass spectra where every peak shown here represents a different chemical entity. And it, uh, so this would allow you to see the hormones and the lipids and others. And just shown here is a bunch of individual dots. These are individual cells, uh, in this case from a rat, uh, uh, cerebellum, and we can actually then measure the lipids in this particular case. Um, we can do this uh, for islets also. Um, and um, actually, just because uh, of time, I'm not going to go into this. The, the approach gets a little bit more complicated about how you find the cells, how you localize them to make sure the cells are independent. And, and we have software 
uh, that we've made available to others and it's all available on the web to do this. And this allows us to do uh, now uh, tens of thousands of cells uh, at a time on a single microscope slide. And when you do this, let's see if this uh, works. This is actually what happens when you take uh, a rodent islet and you scatter, uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, cells from uh, multiple islets onto a, uh, a microscope slide. Even using unsupervised statistical approaches, you can divide the cells into um, categories uh, that represent uh, the cells. And so unsupervised learning, and you still learn, uh, it separates them into alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and other cells because of their peptide hormones. And you can even then start looking at the number of each type of cells uh, within individual islets or other places. Now this would work also, you know, this uh, is completely independent of the animal. It would work with any islet. And uh, we have done this in others. I just happen to have a nice uh, image here from uh, a rat islet. Uh, and we actually can start seeing unusual cells that have unusual processing. Now I put this slide up for two reasons. One to show that and two because of this crazy biochemical method of showing a, a pro-hormone that's processed. And I apologize if you don't like uh, this, but this is just showing you a, a pro-hormone with a single letter abbreviations, methionine, alanine, valine, alanine. So that's MABA continuing. And these bars represent the amino acids and this is pancreatic hormone. It has a characteristic mass. Uh, and what we're seeing is individual dots where we, you know, one of the only groups that show that represent individual cells and each cell uh, then uh, you can see the intensity. And what we're seeing is different cells within one islet actually have different processing enzymes to make different forms of pancreatic hormone. And so um, this allows us to start looking at heterogeneity. Interestingly, with our approach, we don't use up most of the sample. And so we can now take that cell after we've done mass spectrometry on it and do transcriptomics, which I won't show today. That's a new approach that we've done, but we can actually then do capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry and look at neurotransmitters, for example. And here's an example of lipids. This is an alpha cell because it has glucagon. These are some of the small amino acids uh, molecules that are present. And uh, this is just showing you the presence of dopamine, uh, which is in individual cells. And so we have this ability to do multiple approaches on a single cell. So here are some human islets. Uh, these are individual cells from an islet. Uh, and uh, when we you know, now the question is how you show the data. This is just showing you four islets from one uh, donor, and each dot represents a cell. Uh, and uh, islet four here, for example, has a lot of somatostatin cells. Islet one had a lot of glucagon cells, and, and you can see the different uh, peptides, and you can start looking at this heterogeneity. This is, um, this is one of the examples of an unusual finding is oxyntomodulin is a peptide hormone that is from glucagon, but it's actually processed or is only supposed to be processed in the gut and not in an islet. And so um, it's been shown to be uh, a marker uh, of type two diabetes, or at least uh, within the gut. Uh, but as I say, it's not supposed to be within an islet. When I showed this at a, one of the scientific sessions, somebody said, well, a lot of the people who are donors uh, obviously have met a violent uh, death. And so this could actually just be uh, some cells from the gut that are in the wrong place. And so to verify that, um, we took islets from individual well-washed islets. Uh, instead of doing single cells, we did liquid chromatography mass spectrometry and measured all the hormones. And now since there's lots of cells, we, get a, we can use a different approach. And what we use is an approach that allows our assignments to be hyper-competent. So this was ion mobility tandem mass spectrometry. And in these islets from, uh, in this particular case, uh, individual islets, uh, but from uh, five different donors, we're able to see uh, quite a few peptides. Uh, actually, it says 3,000 peptides were identified, 300 uh, proteins, but I'm showing you this because proglucagon uh, processing, these are just the peptides we saw from the, the gene products from glucagon. Uh, is a lot more complicated than people think. And so this is the current understanding if you were to go to the textbook. Again, this crazy way of showing bars based on peptides, signal peptide, GRPP, glucagon. These colored boxes represents the known peptides that are expected from glucagon processing within an islet. Uh, again, the length of the bar happens to do with the amino acids that are present. Uh, this on the right is the process that we actually see in individual islets. 
And so, yes, we see glucagon, we see, uh, but we also see within islets, uh, oxentomodulin, uh, we see some uh, modified forms. Uh, and as one example, something that was quite surprising, uh, we see uh, a different signal peptide cleavage site. So gluc uh, uh, glucagon normally is cleaved at this particular site, but uh, we do see uh, in uh, uh, over 50% of the uh, individuals that we looked at, we see a modified form that's three amino acids longer. Uh, that's not true of any other islet prohormone we've seen, but it has been shown. Uh, we've actually, we and others have observed that in a few other prohormones. And in general, that is, uh, uh, it changes the peptide forms. It also changes, um, it has an impact uh, on these peptides lifetime, because for example, what determines how long a peptide lasts after release uh, sometimes is caused by uh, uh, amino peptidases. And so having extra amino acids here can change lifetime and receptor binding. And so uh, this is showing that even in a very well characterized pro-hormone uh, glucagon processing, you have a lot of extra uh, peptide, pro you know, peptide products. Um, and we're still trying to understand um, when these occur and uh, if they're correlated uh, with type 2 diabetes. Uh, we have, we've just received some additional samples and we're looking to see uh, how this correlates. Um, with this, these samples, there's a lot of other uh, peptides, as a, you know, actually several hundred uh, form peptide hormones that we, forms that we see. I just wanted to show you, uh, you know, this is also uh, perhaps a surprise. This is looking at insulin. Obviously, most of you know it's an A and a B chain disulfide bonded together. And uh, again, this is now showing you the single amino acid code. These blue bars are the peptides that we had uh, these hyperconfident identifications on. And I underlined a section right here. Uh, we also see uh, a section where this, these amino acids are missing. And you can see this. This is a known uh, transcript uh, where uh, it's missing this particular section, uh, but no one has actually reported its presence. And we can see that uh, those are found uh, in uh, some individuals where we see uh, some of the insulin is in the shorter form missing these amino acids. Uh, and so again, uh, a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, this is a different peptide, again, a different structure, shape, and potentially a uh, different receptor binding. We haven't uh, done any of those experiments yet, and nor have we correlated this particular one to um, uh, the differences between the different uh, samples that we have. And then lastly, uh, I'll give you one other uh, example of this, just, uh, just illustrating a few. Uh, amyloid polypeptide is detected in individual islets. There is another pro-hormone, uh, it's a silly name, pro or pro -SAS. And it's called that just because I think somewhere here it is. There's serine alanine, alanine, serine. So the person who first discovered this in the brain uh, called it prosace and called these the SACE peptides because of this serine alanine, alanine, serine, serine motif. Uh, it's recently been said that um, uh, this peptide can block uh, amyloid uh, polypeptide uh, has an uh, activity. Uh, and it also uh, actually has a differential processing in different tissues. Uh, we actually observe uh, not only the SACE peptides, but you know, this is a wraparound because it's so long. We also see other peptides. Uh, Lakshmi Devi uh, recently showed that the pen and len peptides in this particular area uh, are related to pain response and actually bind to one of the, uh, uh, to the opioid receptors. And so uh, what they're doing in the nylon, we don't know, but uh, they're present uh, and uh, fully processed uh, peptides. And again, uh, this is uh, not very well characterized. So that's sort of a, a listing of some of the peptides that we see, how they change. Um, and I just wanted to kind of, uh, I probably could spend the entire time talking about that, but that's a very small part of the molecular repertoire of an islet. And so uh, this was just showing you, uh, going back to this, we can do lipids, we can do um, other molecules. As somebody who works in the brain and looks at neurotransmitters and cell to cell signaling molecules, I thought I would show you, um, something that I find that quite interesting. And that is, I already showed you a slide that dopamine is in an islet. You may or may not know that there's serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA, all the neurotransmitters uh, are also islet transmitters. They're co-localized at times in the same vesicles as the hormone. So serotonin is co-localized uh, to uh, the insulin granulars of vesicles, acetylcholine uh, may be also uh, uh, in the alpha cells. And all of these have uh, a function. Uh, many of them seem to uh, deal with uh, the, or some of these deal with the uh, um, 
the pulsatile release of uh, insulin and have other factors. We can detect uh, these in the human uh, islets. This is just one example of a different form of mass spectrometry. We can see large amounts of GABA, but we also see all the other transmitters. And so um, it's, I'm not sure what the right term is to call them neurotransmitters if they're not in neurons, but all the, you know, the islet is surprising to me is it seems to have the full repertoire of, of classical transmitters. Um, I thought I would end, um, make sure I'm not, yeah. Uh, with one last uh, example though, and this is what we've been spending a lot of time on, and that's D-amino acids. Um, so most people are aware that life with higher animals mostly uses L-amino acids. D-amino acids weigh the same, they're mirror images of each other. And if you think that changes receptor binding, if you ever shake somebody's hand with the wrong hand, it won't work. <clears throat> We're not the first one to see this. The reason I should add, this is the information that's been gathered only in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, but misregulation of D-serine is uh, correlated to schizophrenia and uh, uh, some of the uh, major depressive disorders. Uh, D-serine is also found, it binds to the memory uh, receptor NMDA. It's also found in all uh, mammalian islets. Uh, it's made, uh, D-serine, for example, is made with serine race mace. Uh, D-aspartate is also co-localized with glucagon. Surprisingly enough, uh, the enzyme that makes it is not well characterized. We characterize in my lab the first uh, neuronal uh, D aspartate race mace, and it, it looks like uh, that also uh, it correlates. Uh, there's a, a similar enzyme that's not been shown to be active, but it probably is in uh, human. D alanine has no pathway to formation, it's co localized in the same cells as with insulin, but there's no known way to make it. And I'll show what that means in a minute. So we can measure. D uh, I'm going to looking at time, I'm gonna skip just some background on these uh, and say we can measure these molecules. We have to specifically look for them because mass spectrometry is notoriously hard to do this. Now, this isn't a rodent um, because we can do bio uh, these living assays and I'll show uh, a little easier, uh, but we see, we're starting to see similar results in uh, a human. So this is again, all unpublished work, uh, but if you take compared to the control uh, about three millimolar glucose, if you add uh, uh, high levels of glucose, you see uh, D amino acids are released. Um, and this is uh, showing this uh, for um, the serine. Uh, and uh, if you look at an individual uh, set of islets, you actually have um, a significant release uh, of, um, and uh, the levels within the islets don't change as much. Now, one of the, again, interesting points of this is the serine is made within an islet and the alanine uh, is from outside sources. And um, this is Joe showing some uh, human data, but just also illustrates how we do this. There's a small peak of D-serine compared to L-serine. L-serine is used for protein synthesis. We uh, have a, a modified highly active form of D-amino acid oxidase that can get rid of that peak. We can spike, and this is how we do this. Uh, we're starting to see trends of, uh, of different levels of D-serine in type two versus healthy, but there's a lot of variability. Uh, and we have some samples that are currently being analyzed. Um, this is D aspartate, uh, same type of data. Now, D serine and D alanine are uh, hit the uh, glycine binding site and modify NMDA receptor response. Uh, D aspartate supposedly hits a different receptor, uh, not the NMDA, but another glutamate receptor or so, so called uh, low affinity uh, that responds to, uh, to D aspartate. Um, and uh, make sure we have time for questions. I just wanted to, to end with the D alanine work. D-alanine is um, not made uh, within the islet, and we don't detect it in human islets. We do detect it in our rodent islets, and we realize that that may be because it's not made. And so these living islets will lose uh, the readily releasable pool of vesicles. This has been shown in other cases. When we first get the islets, the amount of peptides and actually classical transmitters are low. Are low. And if you let them sit for 12 to 24 hours without much movement, then they regenerate. But the D-alanine can't regenerate. Uh, this is a, a recent paper, or uh, actually, uh, showing that if you use germ-free animals and uh, look at, uh, in this particular case, plasma levels of D-alanine, in germ-free animals, there's almost no D-alanine. Uh, we actually uh, then did this measurement using isotopically labeled alanine. Uh, there's the L and, the, uh, and there's the uh, D, and it turns out they take up, uh, they can take up uh, they, the L, but they can't convert it. Uh, and uh, they, um, and so again, unlike serine and aspartate, this, this is coming from another source. Um, and 
the thought is that this is because of the data like this, it's probably the gut microbiome. Uh, and the reason the gut microbiome is high in dialanine is because uh, this is found in some of the microbes within the gut and their cell walls. Uh, and so uh, it would be a lot. And we wanted to test that. Uh, we just actually took some uh, uh, germ-free hey, animals. Jonathan, I'm yep. sorry. We're, okay. We're, okay. We're getting, there's a lot of questions already. Okay, great. I will end here and skip okay. that and just simply end right and say, I want to thank everyone. I just had a couple more slides. Uh, and um, thank the people who have uh, worked with us. Uh, Charles uh, Barant is my mentor and has given us some nice advice on where to get islets when we had some supply issues, Mark Atkinson and others, and especially uh, the Visionary Award. And that's uh, it. So I'd be happy to answer questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much. It's fascinating and, and really uh, groundbreaking stuff. So uh, there are a number of questions. I'm going to go from uh, the top. Uh, Jane Roish asked, have you picked up any hybrid insulin peptides? Um, that's a great question. Um, we, we have the data to look for those and we haven't done a complete job of uh, de novo sequencing looking for them. And so they weren't in our database. We are mostly looking for known uh, insulin related peptides. And so that is on our list of things to do. We have actually quite a few terabytes of data to go through and we should look at that uh, those that are known and reported and see if we see any. We are seeing, as I say, unusual ones, but they seem to be, uh, as I say, some of these uh, unusual transcripts. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna actually glom together my question and Gokhan's question. <clears throat> so my question was, have you had a chance to analyze your, your pro-hormone processing technology where you rigged the system? And what I was thinking of is... Uh, Sounds like an election. Yeah, rodent... Ro <laughs> rodent models with deficient pro-convertase enzymes, right? Where you would expect to see a perturbation in pro-hormone processing. And that relates to Gokhan's question, which is at the other end of the spectrum, how sensitive are these methodologies for uh, detecting certain peptides? Okay, so first as we've done that with rodents, obviously not people, um, uh, deficient in some carbo carboxypeptidase and others and we see the extended peptides and we can see those quite well. Um, Vivian Hook, who is convinced that you get some peptide processing using um, um, some other processing enzymes. We've actually looked at her samples and we didn't see, but then it turns out she didn't also. Um, and so, yes, it's very sensitive to peptide form. We've even done this uh, with somebody in fruit flies where they actually turned on and off different enzymes and we were actually able to follow the processing as expected. So it's very sensitive to uh, molecular mass and so peptide forms. Um, Okay. So if no. you want to ask detectability, so there's, you know, you can use the word sensitivity in two ways. If, if you change the mass, we'll see it. So it's, you know, so as you change sequence, you add a post-translational modification. If you mean how sensitive are you to different peptide forms um, exquisitely. If you mean how much can we detect, um, our detection limits under perfect cases are in the 10 to 100 zeptomol range, which would mean maybe what's in a single vesicle. Um, but what we can't do as well is if you had a million vesicles of one form and one vesicle of the other, the dynamic range of ability to see things is a little bit more limited. So if, if you have, you know, you would have to then do a separation first. So if you're doing just the, the moldy mass spectrometry, um, we have a dynamic range problem where one peptide can overwhelm another if they're close. Okay. Um... I'm going to take one element of a question from Maxence Nachery. Um, have, can you either synthesize or purify some of the novel peptides that you have found and test their biological activities? Well, first you can synthesize anything. I'm in a chemistry department, but peptides are really, we make a lot of the peptides ourselves. Right. So we can synthesize them very easily. Peptides are trivial to synthesize mostly. Um, the modifications that we're seeing are pretty straightforward. There's none of them are glycosylated. So we can synthesize these uh, and test their bioactivity. <clears throat> um, Have you found any um, from, you know, the, the beautiful analysis you showed of specific variants uh, in the pro-hormone pro processing cascade? Have you found, have you been able to test any of those variants and found any difference in biological? We have not done that yet per se. So one of the things is we see, for example, in a rodent, a slightly shorter form in some cells 
of uh, one of the uh, pancreatic hormone. And interestingly enough, somebody uh, about eight years ago, and I can't remember the group, proposed that that might be made because it's monobasic sites surrounded. And they tested it and said, oh, this hits the neuropeptide Y4 receptor. And uh, they showed nice receptor binding. And then they went and did LC mass spec and didn't detect it. They said, I guess it's not present. So they already showed bioactivity, but they couldn't detect it. We see it in one in a hundred cells of, of, of the gamma cells. And so in some ways that one is cheating because we didn't do the bioactivity. It was known to be active. We just happened to see that it's an unusual cells. Um, in the case of accentomodulin, um, the, the bioactivity in some ways is already known. It even has been known uh, how it in, uh, interacts with the, um, the islets. It was just presumed to only be made in the gut and uh, the internal endocrine cells of the gut and not in the alpha cells. And so in some cases, because this is a well-characterized system, uh, some of these have already been tested and shown to be bioactive. It, the problem is they weren't known to be made in an islet. Well, to, uh, and related to that point, the last question, simple one from Martin Myers. Did you detect GLP-1, fully processed GLP-1 in your islet experiments? Um, you know, it's, it's, yes. thought more, it's thought more as a, a product of the pro on gene made in the gut, but did you yes, detect it? We detect it. Yes. yes, the only thing I showed that I'm a little bit hesitant to say, so we see GLP-1. You will see that a few of the pro-hormone products were also shown to be acetylated, and we're trying to determine if that is an artifact of the way we extracted the peptides. So um, the two modifications I worry about reporting are acetylation because of the fact that we used a, uh, an acetylated, I mean, a, 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 an acidified um, extraction solution, and then oxidation, because I don't know where it was oxidized. That could have been, but we did see fully processed GOP. Why? All right. With that, Jonathan, thanks a million. That was really stimulating. And uh, we're going to need to move on now to our second talk today, uh, which will be given by Paul Cohen from the Rockefeller University. And the title is Brown Fat and Cardiometabolic Health. Uh, Paul, jump in. Oh, Paul, you're muted. Sorry about that. I had a small technical issue. I'm going to um, share my screen again. Okay, we should be good to go now. Thank you uh, again for giving me a chance to share our work. Um, my uh, research interest uh, for most of my career has been in understanding the links between obesity and disease. And as you're all familiar, uh, obesity is associated with the constellation of serious and chronic diseases, namely type two diabetes, cancer, heart disease, uh, and over the past year, uh, COVID-19. Um, my interest in this area actually largely comes from my clinical experiences as a cardiologist. And I thought I'd just um, highlight a patient that I've taken care of to kind of illustrate the complexity of pathology related to obesity and how that informs our basic work. So this patient, when I met him, was 44-year-old man with obesity, hypertension, um, dyslipidemia, and coronary artery disease. Um, when I initially met him, he called me one night and his exact words were, my wife thinks I'm having chest pain. And then he paused and said, but I feel fine. Um, he of course was not fine. And a few hours later, he showed up in the emergency room with a heart attack, ended up uh, requiring urgent coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Unfortunately, in the operating room, he was also found to have a mediastinal mass which was biopsied and turned out to be diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So after he recovered from his bypass surgery, he initiated chemotherapy that was complicated by cardiomyopathy from adriamycin. So we can't see the screen, uh, Chris. Right, uh, I, I was waiting to jump in, uh, but thank you, Rohit. Oh, you're actually not uh, sharing right now, so Paul. Okay, I'm gonna, 
try again. I don't know why this isn't. Um... Although your narrative was clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Let me um, go back. I won't start over. Um, okay. So this this poor guy um, ultimately completed his chemotherapy uh, with presumed cure. But a couple of years later on a surveillance scan was found to have a new renal cell carcinoma that was treated with cryoablation. And then over the subsequent years, he had numerous episodes of chest pain requiring stenting, um, was later diagnosed with type two diabetes. And I would argue that the fundamental underlying problem in this gentleman is the information here um, with a BMI of 42 and significant uh, visceral adiposity. And so in my lab, we focus on the biology of adipose tissue and fat cells as a way into understanding the pathology of patients like this. And as you all know, mammals have both white fat cells that can store excess energy, as well as brown fat cells that can dissipate chemical energy in the form of heat. And the way that this works is shown here. This is um, a blow up of the mitochondria and uh, brown fat cells uniquely express this protein called UCP1 or uncoupling protein 1 that can uncouple the mitochondrial respiratory chain such that protons are leaked back across the inner membrane rather than being used to power the synthesis of ATP. And of course, this process not only consumes energy, but it also catabolizes metabolites like glucose, free fatty acids, and branch chain amino acids all of which have been linked to insulin resistance and type two diabetes. So uh, we probably evolved brown fat to protect against hypothermia. And you can see here in this thermal imaging, this is a newborn mouse that has ventured from its cage mates. And you can see this really strong heat emitting signal uh, in an interscapular region. And this is developmentally preformed brown fat. Uh, in addition, mammals have the ability to induce brown fat in response to cold exposure or other stimuli, which is seen in this really dramatic dissection here of a mouse that's been housed uh, for several weeks at six degrees Celsius. And so these observations and others led people to appreciate that in addition to preformed brown fat, mammals also contain inducible brown fat cells that we now most commonly refer to as beige adipocytes these cells have many of the same properties as brown fat cells with the key property being that their activity is highly inducible. And so in prior work uh, that I started as a postdoctoral fellow, we identified this protein PRDM16 as a key transcriptional regulator of thermogenic fat. And we saw in mouse models that if you delete PRDM16, you ablate the function of thermogenic beige fat. And with that, you get insulin resistance and many features of the metabolic syndrome. And conversely, if you overexpress PRDM16, you show protection from these conditions. And so this led us to wonder whether perhaps fat could be targeted for therapeutic benefit. And so in my independent lab, we've been approaching that at three levels, at a cellular level, um, a tissue level and at an organismal level. And in fact, the organismal level was the subject of my pathway proposal with the idea being to really understand the full uh, nature of the endocrine properties of thermogenic fat. Um, evidence is emerging that the benefits of thermogenic fat are above and beyond energy expenditure and may be conveyed at least in part through endocrine signals. Um, as we thought about this and progressed along these three lines, however, we began to think more and conventional notions suggest that this might work in mice, but perhaps not in humans. And the reason for that is because the predominant uh, depot of thermogenic fat is uh, this developmentally preformed brown fat. And we know there's a lot of it in newborn animals because they're small and hairless and newborn humans also have this. Um, but for a long time, the view was that thermogenic fat was not relevant in adult humans. However, that notion first began to change with a series of papers in the early 2000s that didn't get much attention because they were in the radiology literature, but using FDG PET scans, which are commonly used to diagnose uh, or track the progression of cancer because they measure the uptake of radio-labeled glucose, radiologists reported that they often saw bilateral uh, uptake in these tissues in a symmetrical manner along the neck. 
And of course, this symmetrical uptake argued strongly against this being a malignancy. And on CT scan, they saw that this, these tissues had the imaging characteristics of fat. And so initially, they referred to this as USA fat or upper supraclavicular area fat. But a series of papers in 2009 really um, ushered in a new era of research in this field because they showed that adult humans not only have this deposit of tissue, but it can be induced in response to cold exposure, as you can see in this PET scan, and it also seems to be functional. And what these studies and a number of subsequent studies showed is uh, first of all, uh, that thermogenic fat in adults can be cold inducible. Uh, in addition, um, the amount of thermogenic fat goes down with age. It goes down in obesity, and women tend to have more thermogenic fat than men. They also were able to show that the amount of thermogenic fat was inversely related to blood glucose levels, meaning people with more thermogenic fat had lower blood glucose. So all of these findings suggest that this might be an attractive target uh, for type 2 diabetes and related conditions in adult humans. Um, as great as this work was, um, one of the uh, limitations uh, to studies is because they rely on PET scans, most existing studies have either been retrospective studies of a few hundred individuals or small prospective studies of tens or so of healthy subjects who have been stimulated with cold exposure to try and maximize their thermogenic fat. And so as we um, approach this, this led us to kind of add to our list of questions in my lab to think, well, if we're gonna really study uh, from a bottom up level thermogenic fat in animal models, it would be really important to have a more comprehensive understanding of what role it plays in humans. And so I'll share with you today some work that was um, fortuitously just came out online a couple of days ago. Um, so I'd like to share that with you today. And so this is the work of Tobias Bescher, a former MD uh, fellow who was in my lab who had training in medicine and cardiology. And he and I realized that if we were to really understand uh, at a comprehensive level what role brown fat plays in human health and disease, we needed a really large data set so that we could have enough statistical power to look for associations between brown fat and uh, a whole constellation of diseases. And so fortunately, we're across the road from Sloan Kettering, which is a large cancer center, and they perform about 20,000 PET scans each year uh, to diagnose or track the progression of cancer. And as I showed you earlier, because brown fat could be misconstrued as representing cancer because it's FDG avid, they always report um, when they read out these scans whether or not brown fat is detected. And so with that, we did a retrospective review of nearly 10 years worth of PET scans. So this was nearly 140,000 scans. And we categorized people based on their brown fat status into either brown fat positive or brown fat negative. And then we linked their brown fat status to all of the data in their electronic health record. And so I'll first just show you some descriptive data. We were happy to see initially that our descriptive data uh, was entirely in agreement with prior publications. So what you can see on top is that out of all of the scans of more than 50,000 patients, about 10% of patients had brown fat. I'll point out that these were clinical scans, so they were not only not done with stimulation, but people were actually asked to uh, refrain from cold and exercise and other things that might stimulate brown fat. So um, having said that, um, about 14% of uh, females and nearly 5% of males had brown fat. The prevalence of brown fat went down with increasing age. It also went down with increasing body mass index. And when we looked at the prevalence of brown fat as a function of outdoor temperature in the month of the scan, we saw an inverse relationship such that scans done in colder winter months were more likely to have brown fat detected. And so what we then did is we wanted to control for these known variables. And so we used a common technique called propensity score matching. This allows you to assemble a cohort analogous to a case control study where you can match individuals controlling for a number of variables. And so we took our entire cohort 
and matched individuals with and without brown fat matched for age, sex, BMI, and outdoor temperature at the time of the scan. And so with that, we had a roughly one to two matched cohort of nearly 5,000 people with brown fat and nearly 10,000 people without brown fat. And so I'll just show you some of the highlights from our study here. Uh, first of all, when we uh, use this propensity score matched cohort and linked this to all of the information in patients' charts, we saw a really dramatic reduction in a variety of chronic diseases. So on uh, the left here in panel A is the overall prevalence numbers, and on the right is a forest plot showing the odds ratios of these conditions. And those conditions in red show significantly lower odds in individuals with brown fat. So you can see um, that people with brown fat matched for BMI and these other variables have significantly lower odds of type two diabetes and dyslipidemia. And those uh, associations have been documented in the past, but we saw also associations that hadn't really been reported before, including for coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, congestive heart failure and hypertension. We also took this matched cohort, and when we stratified people by BMI into three categories, either normal, overweight, and obese, we saw that the presence of brown fat protected against pathology at all three BMI strata. So if you look for diabetes, for example, individuals in blue are those without brown fat. You can see as BMI increases, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes goes up, and that's what we all know to be the case but people with brown fat show protection at all three BMI strata such that people who are obese with brown fat have a prevalence of type two diabetes that is only slightly higher than people of normal weight without brown fat. And we saw similar patterns for these other conditions here. We were also able to link this to lab values uh, drawn in close temporal proximity to the time of the PET scan. And what we saw here was again congruent with our findings. So people with brown fat had lower fasting blood glucose values. These are drawn on the day of the scan. We also looked at the relationship between BMI and these lab values. And so people without brown fat show a strong linear relationship between BMI and blood glucose. And that is very much blunted in people with brown fat. We saw a similar observation for triglycerides and then a reverse observation for HDL, which is atheroprotective. And so um, what we're now working on is to really try and understand what explains the benefits associated with brown fat. And uh, we don't have a perfect answer yet, but some of the things we've been thinking about include perhaps increased energy expenditure, secondary effects on white fat, um, or perhaps endocrine effects of brown fat. Um, and in addition, we are using this really rich data set to motivate a number of new and ongoing studies. So firstly, um, we've started to look at associations between brown fat and regional adiposity. It's possible on the CT scans to quantify relative amounts of subcutaneous and visceral fat. And our preliminary data indicates that people with brown fat have a lower amount of visceral fat and a higher amount of subcutaneous fat matched by body weight. Uh, because this was taken from a cancer center, we can look for links between brown fat and oncologic outcomes. And then areas that I'm particularly excited about given my basic science background is the ability to now do reverse translation. So we can look at some of these new associations and go back to the lab and use animal models to try and understand the mechanisms for these links between brown fat and these different diseases. We're also digging a lot more deeply into the medication data from uh, these patients to see if we can identify medications associated with increased brown fat um, and to then test whether those associations may perhaps uh, demonstrate causation, which ultimately could allow us to think about repurposing common medications to increase or activate brown fat. Um, we would also love to uh, use these data to try and identify a blood-based biomarker associated with brown fat because one of the main limitations, of course, is that PET scanning is invasive and costly. It also uses radiation. 
So we would love to have a laboratory test that would reliably distinguish people with and without brown fat. And then lastly, and I'll just take a few minutes to tell you about our work in this area before I close, um, we're beginning to investigate the genetics of brown fat in humans. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing in that area. So um, some of you may have heard of this individual. He's all over the internet. Um, his name is Wim Hof. He also calls himself Iceman. And he holds a lot of uh, endurance, cold exposure world records. And he's been studied by a group in the Netherlands that's done a lot of work on brown fat. And not surprisingly, he has a high amount of brown fat for a man of his age. Um, that is perhaps not surprising because he spends a lot of time in the cold uh, with very little clothing, but he uh, has an identical twin brother who does not uh, have the same uh, hobbies as, as Wim Hof, and he also has a very high amount of brown fat. So that's an N of two, but it at least suggests the possibility of a genetic component. Uh, perhaps more telling, though, are data below. So in panel E are data from the 2009 paper from Aaron Sipis and Ron Kahn. And what you can see in their retrospective review, when they quantify brown fat, they see, um, as we saw more recently, that women have more brown fat than men. But if you look at the scatter plot, there are a number of individuals with exceptionally high amounts of brown fat. Uh, similarly, um, in this study from the Netherlands, they looked at people living in the Netherlands, either with Caucasian ancestry or South Asian ancestry, and they saw that people um, of South Asian ancestry had a lower volume of brown fat. So these studies are by no means definitive, but it, they're at least consistent with the notion that the amount or activity of brown fat may be under genetic control. And so what we are doing is going back to this large patient cohort and moving beyond simply a binary description of yes or no for brown fat to actually quantifying uh, the brown fat. And this is of course time consuming because we don't have an automated way to do this yet. Um, but we've done this on a few thousand patients and in doing that we've defined uh, these um, ranges of normal activity based on age. And you can see again that the amount of brown fat goes down with increasing age. And all of the individuals with brown fat activity more than two standard deviations above the age matched mean are shown in red. So again, these are outliers that at least have the potential to have genetic manipulations that contribute to their high amounts of brown fat. Fortunately, a very large number of patients who come to Sloan Kettering have their genome sequenced. And so we are now accessing the um, exome or whole genome sequencing data from these individuals to see if we can identify um, variants that might be associated with increased brown fat. In parallel, we are taking an orthogonal approach, uh, collaborating with Sadaf Faruqi in the UK and Typhoon Oselek um, in Turkey to study um, individuals who are either uh, very lean or very obese uh, and looking at candidate genes, uh, and we've identified a number of genetic variants and genes linked to brown fat function that we're now studying further. And so the way I see this um, going forward is of course these variants are just the starting point, but if we can identify these variants, we can then study them in cell lines in a dish or in animal models and really begin to hopefully uh, bring new insights into genetic determinants of thermogenic fat function. So with that, I will close. I just want to thank uh, the people in my lab who did this work. Uh, this is a picture from a time, uh, like Jonathan said, when we could all get together and go out and hopefully we'll all get there safely again soon. I want to thank our collaborators. And I also really want to thank the Pathway Program for giving me uh, the support early in my career to try uh, different things and this work wouldn't have been possible without that support. So thank you for your attention. Sorry for the AV glitches at the beginning and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. That was again a really inspiring presentation. We'll skip Bergman's question about how the Iceman keeps his guitar in tune and um, uh, we'll go on to uh, Tony Ferrante. Is it is it possible that the mechanism goes something like insulin resistance, less brown fat, and therefore the association with CAD 
HTN, et cetera, reflects the association with insulin resistance? Or were you able to control for insulin resistance in some way? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. And that um, was asked actually by one of the reviewers of our paper. Um, uh, so um, of course we don't have a perfect way to control for insulin resistance because this is a retrospective study. So we don't have insulin levels on these patients and we couldn't um, clamp these patients. But we did do a number of multivariate analyses, including uh, one in which we controlled for type 2 diabetes. And we saw that these associations between hypertension, coronary artery disease, and congestive heart failure uh, were present even when we control for uh, type 2 diabetes. OK. And uh, Sammy Jaffrey asks, uh, what do you think is the molecular receptor for cold that induces the pathway for brown fat formation? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, I think the conventional or textbook pathway is that cold is sensed by sensory neurons in the periphery, a, a sensation is conveyed to the brain that then leads to efferent output by the sympathetic nervous system that releases catecholamines. The catecholamines bind receptors on brown and beige adipocytes and activate a signal transduction cascade resulting in increased thermogenesis. There is uh, data um, that these cells can also be activated in uh, ways independent of adrenergic stimulation. Um, and so there are probably a variety of other pathways. And I think that's an area of active research. Okay, and then um, Praveen Sethapathy asks, uh, are there different strains of mice that exhi exhibit different amounts of brown fat or variable adipose beijing in response to cold exposure? I think he's thinking of something like a collaborative cross resource that you might be able to mine to, you know, to find genes that uh, that predispose to brown fat formation. Yes, uh, great question, and we've done some work in that area too. And so, um, Les Kozak, who discovered UCP1, actually was onto this many years before the collaborative cross was available, but. Um, in the early 1990s, he described cold-induced UCP1 induction um, in white fat depots, which we would now refer to as beige fat, and he saw that the level of induction was highly strain-dependent. Interestingly, obesity-prone strains like uh, C57 Black 6 have a much lower induction than obesity-resistant strains like 129. Um, and he did some crosses and was, I think, in the process of trying to map this to a chromosome and a locus, but I, I don't think it, it got there. I think nowadays with some of the tools available to us, we could take a much broader and unbiased approach and really um, use the mouse model to try and dig deeper into this. But yes, there are absolutely strong uh, genetic uh, determinants in mice. There are also uh, sex and environmental determinants. Okay, and as a moderator, I take the prerogative of a shameless Homer question as the final question. Yeah. Uh, you, you're aware that Chingo Kajimura has shown that brown fat in humans lowers branched chain amino acid levels because brown fat is apparently consuming BCAA. Yeah. Have you had a chance to look at uh, branched chain amino acids in you know, your amazing uh, human cohort that you've assembled? Yeah, so I, I am aware of Shingo's work, and of course I'm aware of your work uh, linking branched chain amino acids to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, our cohort is a retrospective cohort, and it's these are clinical patients, and so uh, we don't have any of those data. Um, many of the patients, um, probably a few thousand, have blood frozen for other studies, and we are now uh, have piggybacked onto a number of those IRBs, which is allowing us to obtain material for genetic studies. And so I do think there will be the potential to measure some new analytes uh, as a research study, but we, we don't have an answer to any of that yet, but we would love to be able to look at those things. All right, well, listen, uh, uh, both Jonathan and Paul, sensational presentations today. Uh, just really loving this, this series and I want to remind everybody that our next session will be Wednesday, February 3rd. Maylin Chang and Maxence Nachery will speak. And I want to thank our speakers today who, again, I think did a sensational job. Thanks, everyone, and see you in a month, February 3rd. Bye-bye.